thanks for your invitation. It's good to be here. And who knows what we're all going to think as the next hour or two passes. I'll talk for about 40 minutes, 45, then we have time for conversation, I think, before my colleague um, gives his uh, paper too. I'm director of the Centre for Death and Life Studies at Durham University as one of my tasks. I'm professor in the study of religion there as my uh, other job, shall we say. One of the perspectives we've been pursuing very much with our students over the last, I don't know, seven years maybe, is looking at the issue of worldviews and the way in which the study of theology and religion occupies a place under the umbrella of worldviews. This makes it much easier in dealing with issues of spirituality and atheism and, and spiritual but not religious and all this kind of thing because the umbrella is, well, these are your worldviews. Let's not get too worked up about precise definitions of where one begins and another ends because by and large you find that people's perspectives on life merge into each other. They might vary between Monday and Friday or between, as I've researched this, between the time you're a very, very keen young Christian at 22 or 18 and you're not by the time you're 58 or 67. Things happen in life. And if one looks at worldviews, then one can see these changes and chances occurring. I simply mention that because shared perspectives on life that emerge as our drive for meaning this characteristic feature of the human animal, and perhaps many other animals too for that matter, creates patterns of values and beliefs and behaviours in response to natural and existential environments. Now, in response to global warming, big. In response to your family environment, etc. Covid as an environment these changes and chances are always there. I play with this idea a lot with my students and I don't know whether it will be useful to you. The world is full of ideas, all sorts of ideas, names for cups and streets and all sorts of things, but some of these ideas become pervaded by an emotion. And when an idea is pervaded by an emotion, when it soaks them up, it becomes a value. That's what values are. They're, idea com they're ideas to which we are committed emotionally. To talk of British values is stupid because it suggests too much. Because there are too many differences to which we are committed. Not everybody's committed to the same thing. Values vary in that sense. But some values help make our sense of identity, create the sense of who we are. Those I would call beliefs. They're not religious beliefs, they can be political, they can be any sort of beliefs. Belief in the family, belief in all sorts of things, the community, all sorts of things. But some beliefs, and this is where I, I want to press this, some beliefs contribute to a sense of destiny. Destiny is a word that was hardly used in English until last week when references to the Prince of Wales become king and the stone of destiny under the chair in which he sat adopted front page in some of the red tops. Destiny. Now destiny is important because in Britain today you can divide the, the world into those who have a sense of destiny and those who don't. By and large, the Christian churches and even more so Islamic movements are really concerned with destiny, with what happens to you through death, beyond death, where for many people death's the end, there is no destiny. Dividing people between those who have, or groups, who have a sense of destiny and those who do not. That's a big issue. And it's now more important than ever in the world as ecology and environmentalism assume the position they have. The world has now become a destiny, destination. And people are waking up to this. Even the churches are waking up to it. It's taken them long enough to think about green issues. Goodness only knows. But that's a talk perhaps for another day. Ideas, values, beliefs, destiny factors. They're kind of background thinking to what I'm going to be talking about uh, just now. Let me take us straight into two directions of flow. In the Book of Common Prayer, the Church of England, 
in the traditional funeral service, we, we say prayers such as this, for as much as it hath pleased Almighty God to take unto himself our brother or sister, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. Friends, you're all sitting there, and you are all, I include myself, vile bodies. Do you think of yourself as a vile body? Is that your identity, as a vile body? Do you attach the emotion of, whatever the adjective of being vile is, uh, it's not really, would you associate that feeling with yourself? I guess not. But there in the book on prayer, who will change our vile body, that it may be like unto his glorious body. Over the years I've thought a lot about these things and have spoken very much about the traditional Christian funerals. Tradi traditional Christian liturgies are eschatological. They look forward to the end times. They look forward to, to death, judgment, resurrection, appearance before God, judgment, all those sort of things. They're all future directed. They're eschatological. They're waiting for the end times. And that fits in with a vast amount of theology which you are more or less familiar with and which I'm not going to elaborate upon just now. But things changed. And maybe from, and you can pick whatever date you like, maybe from the 1960s, 70s, whatever, maybe the somewhere in, in, in the 17th century, people vary on this. A kind of a secularity emerged. A kind of irrelevance of religion. What's the point in it? A kind of irrelevance emerged. And we did research and we found, for example, that it was about 1974, <coughs> excuse me, that people in Britain started taking cremated remains away from crematoria and doing all sorts of private things with them in the UK. Now, I, I wrote a lot about this and I talked about what do they do with these remains? Well, they take them to parks, they put them in rivers, they put them in the Lake District. They take the remains to places that, may, that were significant for them, where they fell in love, where they went on their honeymoon, where, where, where things happened. Now, I call that the retrospective fulfillment of identity. You took Dad, or whoever, you took him back to that place that was important. There's a remarkable difference between the future-looking Fulfillment of identity in the glory of God and fulfillment of identity when dad is put in the, the river Trent because he was really big on fishing. Now these are two different worldview perspectives. I find them useful ways of thinking. In a way. In, our, in the Church of England just now, in some of the alternative services, that language has changed that he will change the body of our low estate. There's a big difference between a body of a low estate, whatever that means, and a vile body. But it's an interesting grammatical shift that I think is associated with an ideological, theological shift as well. Which is beginning then to take us into the world of death and into the, this world that is Liminal, it's betwixt and between, it's on the threshold of this life and, and what? And a future life, a post-human life, or a life in the memory of others, these are the big issues. And that will come up, I think, in our discussion as we move along. However, not only have we had vile bodies, low estate bodies, we've got celebrated bodies. It really started in Australia, in terms of funerals, more secular than anything else. The celebration of a person's life. We are gathered here today to celebrate the life of John Smith, our dear friend and father and brother. And, and what a great guy he was. And we mark that life. We are grateful for that life. We celebrate the life. In the Book of Common Prayer, let me just use that I'm an Anglican, so it's part of my bread and butter, really. Um, there's nothing in the Book of Common Prayer about celebrating the life of anybody other than Jesus Christ. 
And it's alignment with that celebration, you might say, that makes that historical liturgy make sense. The changes since have just been of degree rather than of kind, I, I think. Many current funerals are indeed a, re a, a, a reflection, a celebration of that retrospective identity. We all know who he was, what she did. We bear them in our hearts today. We are grateful for what we, we have and what we share with the, the deceased person. And it's big. In a way, it is a this-worldly worldview. Yes, it frames sadness and it frames loss, but it's always sort of working towards the celebration. I was at the funeral of one of my former students some years ago, uh, not so long actually, before COVID, when we were all encouraged to wear ties of dramatic colour, because he was into ties. And indeed there were some ties available at the door in case you didn't have one. That's quite a remarkable thing. And yet, for many now, it's, a, it's a, almost a familiarity. And in a way, it's being alert to the familiar that I want to deal with today, as well as introducing some special, uh, perhaps not so familiar, issues. Because this celebration of bodies is now coming to be framed by the worldview, by this ecological environmental worldview. This, it seems to me, is the contemporary grand narrative. You know, the great thing about being an academic is that you can get on your hobby horse every now and again and really get your students going. And I love doing this. I usually tell them, you know, this is a hobby horse. Just dismiss it if you want to. But one of my lovely hobby horses is, is um, running against postmodernism as a concept and people who regard themselves as postmodernists. It's, it's a good game to play. And I tend to say, well, the last nail in the coffin of postmodernism lies in environmentalism and global warming. Why? Because this is now a grand narrative for the whole world, not just for a, a, an elite English class academic group sitting in some university somewhere. There are probably about, I don't know, 420 postmodernists in Britain. Choose your number. But they ain't postmodernists when they go home when family strife sets about them, when community issues emerge. It's as though postmodernism is a game to play with others who know the rules. I don't play that particular game. And now, especially with this grand narrative of the peril of the world around us, we need to share that story. Historically, in places like this, in Christian churches everywhere, there has been a grand narrative. It was the grand narrative of creation, fall, redemption. That was the grand narrative. Salvation history, it was called. Well, now there's a kind of a secular salvation history of the world, its peril, and its potential salvation through ecological shifts. Or not, as the case may be. I hope you see roughly where I'm going at this point. There it is. But now how do we bring that worldview, that perspective, that grand narrative to bear, if you like, upon funeral services? This is now where it begins to get a little bit confused and messy and etc., etc. Well, another grand narrative in which we live is the grand narrative of communication. The rem remarkable networks of communication that we all have with each other. And this is very complicated. I thought I would mention just here because I'm delighted to say on the bottom line there, Johanna Sumiala, we have Professor Sumiala with us today, all the way from Helsinki. So, Johanna, thank you for coming. And, and she has got together a, a, a big research program in which University of Helsinki and Aarhus in Norway and Durham here and Bucharest in Romania, we are all getting together to think hard about digital death. What does it mean to have death appearing online in all sorts of ways, which I'm not going to go into now. But I'm flagging it up because the grand narrative of environmental ecology has running alongside it another grand narrative of global communication between persons and what that means for human identity and perhaps for destiny.
These are bits of the jigsaw I'm trying to, as it were, put together. We are trying to put together. Because in a way, we have to do with virtual identities. What happens to our identity when we're dead and people, as it were, resurrect us online? There are these kind of virtual identities going on. Now, during COVID, there's been in the UK a dramatic rise in the in online funerals, in the live streaming of funerals. We're doing some research on that as part of our project. Online memorials, post-mortal presences. One of my former students who, who sadly died, a different person, every now and again it flashes up on my screen, I'm supposed to congratulate him on some new anniversary that he's made. He's not made any anniversaries, he's dead. And many of you will have had experiences like this, where the the dead return to us, uninvited. Perhaps not unwelcome when they come, but uninvited. So that there are many little moments when the day of the dead happens to be a Thursday morning in November, or January, or August. You know what I mean, I won't dwell on it. It It is an issue of how we now start thinking about ourselves. The rough changes that have taken place also between 2000 and about now in the UK has been, um, in terms of death, those who conduct funerals. There's been a big shift from the clergy conducting funerals to lay people, uh, civil celebrants who may or may not be of a religious persuasion and humanists who are of a humanist persuasion are taking funerals, perhaps more than 50% now. This is one of the biggest if you're using statistics to mark secularization, who takes funerals might be one good index. And certainly that is an index that has shifted in some parts of the country more than in others, but it's there. And more than that, people finding a sense of new identity for themselves in being a funeral celebrant. Many of you here who've been ministers, and I know there are several, will have had that experience of people at, at the end of a church service saying what in Anglican is would be nice service, Victor, or the like. And that's very affirming of the self. You feel, I preached the word of God today. I did the stuff. And they've told me that I've done it. And that's great. But you can take that ritual experience and relocate it. And that's what's happening, I think, with civil celebrants. People who in ordinary everyday life perhaps don't have a particular, are not in the limelight very much, never have been. Don't have a social role to play, though they may have done. But now, for various personal reasons, they become civil celebrants. And they've got a large, they've got a chapel full of people, and they are leading the behavior of this group. That is self-affirming with a vengeance. It's like being on a West End stage at a matinee performance. I'm exaggerating for effect, but it's something like that. And it brings joy to people, and they in turn want to feed this joy back into those they, they serve. This is a big change in the religious life of Britain over the last 20 years. We know too how things have changed in Britain. You know these factors very well. We are now at about 80% cremation in in Britain. This is problematic because of cremation, fumes, exhausts, problems of gas versus electricity. Lots of crematoria have had and are having to install great equipment to filter out mercury and other uh, emissions at considerable expense, by the way. Lot going on. Over, it started just before COVID. Many of you, or maybe not, I don't know, will watch the television in the afternoon in between Inspector Morse or somebody will have an advert about no fuss cremations or we do it your way. And we'll do all sorts of things because that's what we do and we're good at it. And the commercialism of choice in this kind of neoliberal society where choice is everything, you might say. Direct cremation would be one of the names advertised. No fast funerals. They will take the dead away, cremate them, return the ashes to you. No service is necessary. So there's a de-ritualizing or de-liturgizing of death. This is another perhaps another index of secularization, it is certainly an index of change. 
it was radically intensified during COVID for obvious reasons. It's very difficult to, to get your hands on the statistics, but it might have been a shift from something like maybe 4% of deaths in Britain pre, maybe 15% or, or thereabouts during COVID. Dead taken away, ashes returned, you then do what you like with them as before, as it were. And that's a major change. Ashes, they are the portable dead. And there are many houses in Britain where you find them. A brief march into history. The great Dr. William Price, there he is, young man, one of the youngest, one of the youngest men who became fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. But instead of staying in London and treating the apparently sick, went back to the South Wales Valleys into the, the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and a remarkable, a remarkable man. Yeah, he was part of the romantic movement of the rise of bardism, and there he is on the right-hand side, dressed in his famous costume with a fox fur over his head. Uh, but, but this remarkable man, this free thinker, cremates his little boy. He never married, but he, he, um, he had children, not least one when he was 80 or so years, years old. And the little boy, he named Jesse Greece, Jesus Christ in Welsh, and when the little boy died, he cremated him on top of a, of a mountain, on, on a Sunday in Bible Black Wales, he was arrested <laughs> and was taken to the Assizes in Cardiff where he was tried for this. And cut a long and wonderful story short, he came up before a judge who had spent a good period of his life serving the empire in India. How remarkable that burning, that cremating your little boy on a Welsh mountain would have been heard by a guy who spent much of his life in cremation India. Remarkable. Anyway, it was said that he had not, it was not illegal, it was not illegal to do so, as long as you didn't disturb the peace. Interesting. But that prompted others who here in London had created the Cremation Society. Sir Henry Thompson had created uh, the Cremation Society, he had written a famous paper, 1874, The Treatment of the Body After Death, in the Contemporary Review, a very significant journal. He sets up the Cremation Society, 1874, and then they work towards the first cremation at Woking, prompted by the, the action of Dr. Price at law. So this is the way, you know, Brit changes in, in custom occur, really. So Francis Seymour Hayden, great man, uh, also, he, he was a, a, an opponent, and he set up, he had wrote this book, Earth to Earth, a plea for a change of system in our burial of the dead, 1875. We shall use no coffin, that would be best, or a wicker, or latticework one, which you will now see in hearses quite regularly in Britain today. Let me take it back to, to Sir Francis. Bury 40 hours at most after death. The properties of the so soil are well known. Cremation is a wild project to drive us into vapour. So you had some of the establishment, the British establishment, opposing each other in the 1870s as to what we should do with our dead. Uh, just behind our Department of Theology in Durham, about five or six weeks ago, I was walking out that way, when I suddenly see on top of a wall a cremation urn. Now, we're about 300 yards from Durham Cathedral there, but it's behind a building. I thought, somebody has come, and it's quite high up. It looks low, but it's not quite high. It would be higher than the screen on which it is now being shown. Somebody has come, they brought a ladder, and they put these cremated remains up near Durham Cathedral, but well out of sight. They were there only for about a week, and then one day I went out and they were gone. Why? What that meant? No idea. We can't but guess. But somebody obviously wanted the cremated remains somewhere up there in this World Heritage Site for a moment or two. Woodland burials been the other great development. Woodland natural ecological burial, green burial is sometimes called as well, started in 1994-95 uh, up in the northwest of England um, by a man called Ken West, a remarkable guy who was asked by a couple of ladies whether they could have a cheap funeral, whether he could get them a cardboard coffin. He said, yeah, sure, we can do that. Um, and he said, well, we've got a field, we can bury you in if you like. And from that, 
The woodland burial movement in Britain began. There are now 340, 350. We do not know how many such sites there are in Britain, but there are many. And that we did research on this. There's a book, um, Natural Burial, by myself and Hannah Rumble, who was my doctoral student at the time. We interviewed families and so on. Giving something back to nature was one motif. This is before the environmental thing was really going. People, many like yourselves maybe, were into gardening and stuff. Let me become a kind of a compost. I will give something back to the world. Big, big theme still going, and many of you will have had experience of that. That was a lovely little sign above one grave in a natural burial site I've been looking at from Pooh Bear is there. If, I, if there ever comes a time when we can't be together, it says something to keep me in your heart, I'll stay there forever. These kind of sentiments, mostly in wooden burial sites, they don't allow things like that. But people are inventive and will stick things up trees given half a chance, and that just happened to be one of them. Woodland burial leading us into this modern world. Now, just now and within the next few months, we will see active within the UK this process of alkaline hydrolysis. Trade name, resomation. Doesn't mean anything, it's just a word. Resomation. In which the body is taken and put in a, a container and is subject to um, light, alkaline solution, heated and under pressure. And the machine is like that. They are, those machines are made uh, near Leeds by a company. Uh, and they are, it's been used in the States since about 19, for the last 12 years or so. And the, the first machine is ready for action in the UK. And we'll, you will be hearing about this in the media over the next couple of months. I've been trying to prompt the Church of England to think seriously about what liturgy you might think appropriate for the dissolving of human bodies. Christians always want to put words to things. We put words to eating bread and wine. We put words to baptism. I see a baptismal font under the floor behind me. Put wor what words do we put as we move from vile bodies to lower states to, to what? And I'm prompting uh, thoughts amongst various persons on that kind of issue just now. What on earth do you call it, you know? Do we say earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust? Or is it inappropriate when you're going to put them in to a, a, a machine for dissolving? Perhaps not, perhaps it is. Uh, but going back to, the, to the, uh, the earlier slide just there, you end up with pure white, pure white ash, you get more stuff back out than you get out of a cremator, but you end up with remains that you could then do with as you currently do with cremated remains. The remains are with you. But what, how do you cover, as it were, the process that's going on in between? I put just one of the prayers of the Church of England in here, it's from the baptism service, to show, what we're, to show how water has been really capitalised upon theologically. Loving Father, we thank you for your servant Moses, who led your people through the waters of the Red Sea to freedom in the Promised Land. We thank you for your son Jesus, who has passed through the deep waters of death and open for all the way of salvation. Now send your spirit that those who are washed in this water may die with Christ and rise with him and find true freedom as your children alive in Christ forever. There's a lot of water in the Bible and I'm sure much could be made of this liturgically. We await to see what happens. There are links. There are links here. Uh, with all sorts of water words, water and ecology, we can link, there are many potential creative moves that theologians could make in all this. Now I want to bring us to something which is a conundrum in life and faith. I'm going to call it the theological liturgical conundrum. Vile bodies, part of that creation for redemption process I mentioned earlier, but then St. Paul, now here is a guy. I often wonder why my, I've spent all my life working alongside theologians and any great theologian feels he cannot die until he's written his book on St. Paul. You've got to do it. And when you stop thinking, now that I think about it more, because I'm doing other stuff on Paul myself, 
Now I think about it more, I can see why. Because of course, he, in many ways, he made the Christianity that most modern Christians follow. Because Jesus wasn't a Christian, in that sense, but it was some of his followers who created forms of Christianity, like St. John, the Johannine forms of Christianity, the eschatological forms of Christianity in the Revelation. There are lots of types of Christianity, but Paul's was one of them. And in, integral to him was this sting, the sting of death, the outcome of sin. So we now begin to get into bodies dying, dead, to be resurrected, surrounded by the Christian words. Yes, of eschatological fulfillment. Opposite the celebrated lives that I talked to earlier on. But there's an issue here, and I will develop it slowly. We develop it perhaps alongside the idea of reverence for life. Albert Schweitzer is one of my great historical heroes, theological as well as otherwise. And most modern students don't know Albert Schweitzer, they've never heard of him until they get lectured on him, then they love him, and it's interesting. Albert Schweitzer was absolutely frustrated by the nations of the world kill, uh, blowing living dangers out of each other. He was one of the greatest theological and philosophical thinkers that we had, and one of the greatest musicians that Europe had. And he goes off to Africa, as he saw it, to serve the Lord, when other people said to him, you're such a talented man, don't go into the back of beyond. And he writes, many of those guys who said that to me had preached their own sermons on the pearl of great price. And of treasuring what you've got. Anyway, off he goes, and it dawns on him in the midst of all this chaos that reverence for life was a way of thinking about stuff and living it out. How might that apply today? What is reverence for life, for dissolving bodies, for preserving the world? For dissolving bodies, for preserving the world. Because resumation has a carbon footprint much, 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 much lower than cremation. It uses much, 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 much less land than burial, or woodland burial. So what then, if you like, are the ethics of disposal? in relation to ecology and then to theological dressing of it. The ecological environmental grand narrative echoes a kind of natural salvation history, we might say. I'm going to put in here, because I thought maybe you'll be getting dreadfully weary by now, a little historical postscript, which nobody ever knows of before I mentioned it. And I only got to hear of it because one of my third year students in her dissertation brought it up. And I was shocked that having worked in death studies for much of my later life, I'd never come across it. Anthony Trollope, one of the greatest of all British novelists, wrote a book called The Fixed Period. For those of you who don't know it, he was, he was reading on the beach over the summer. The Fixed Period. It was published in 1882, at the time when these cremation debates were all happening. And he was part of the London literati who were caught up in these discussions, not very, very far from here. The Fixed Period, published in 1882, but I think anticipating the 1980s quite a bit. Right, text from it. There were these young people, they founded a new country somewhere off New Zealand, they decided to set up laws for themselves, they're all bright young things, and, and, and amongst it all, they, in the de debates in their parliament, they said things like, 65 is the proper fixed period for the human race. It is self-evident that at 65 a man has done all that he is fit to do. Now, half of the room is immediately cut out of existence. Uh, I'm amongst the oldest, so I can say this easily. He should be troubled no longer with labor, and therefore should be troubled no longer with life. And then it goes, so they're going to build this college now, this beautiful college, like some of the Oxbridge colleges, and when you were 64, you're going to be taken into the college and treated like kings having feasts every night, as it were. 
And then at the end of it, when you're 65, you would be euthanized and cremated in the crematorium built just behind the college. Now, whether this was written with tongue-in-cheek for what was going on in the UK or not, who's to say? But it is interesting with the implicit assumptions that are there. Lead me into the college, and there let me prepare myself for that brighter life which will require no mortal strength. How long, they said, we fought over this fixed period until they arrived at that age. And the novel goes on and it gets better because, because they start to get old themselves. <laughs> and, and, and I won't tell you the rest of the story. Read it for yourself. But Trollope was on it. There's a kind of sadness and celebration involved in the conquest of death. These guys were setting out to, to combine death by combining euthanasia with cremation. Now we are moving in our own country nowadays to a kind of secular spiritual funerals. They're all a bit mixed, really. They, I think the British humanists are having a slightly rough time of it because they want genuinely ideologi humanist ideologically dread funerals. But secular celebrants and ordinary human celebrants will have the Lord's Prayer here, a bit of sacred music there, uh, talks from the family as well. So it's a lovely sort of, like life really, a mixed hodgepodge of things that are important to us. And it's, it's as difficult to bring humanist ideology to that as it is hardline Christian evangelicalism. Let me put it like that. That's the state we're in in Britain just now, I think. The celebration of life. What about Christian considerations in relation to this? I guess this is part of your group's interest. Well, the Eucharist, in a sense, is the grand narrative of Christianity, and it's a grand narrative of betrayal and salvation. And one of the things I'm working on in my mind at the moment is where betrayal fits into death, and so on. And where it might relate to euthanasia. Now, in our, what some would call neoliberal societies, my dear colleague Matthew Guest at Dunham has just produced a lovely book on neoliberalism and religion. It's worth a read. Oh, I mentioned it there. Hey, Matthew, there you are. Uh, it, it is worth reading. The issue of choice, of freedom in a consumerist society dealing with death. Because you're worth it. Because your body counts. Well, tough luck, maybe it doesn't. Maybe the world counts more. Or your family counts more. We are entering complexity here with a vengeance. The whole issue of assisted living and assisted dying. Now this is where trust in society comes to play. Some years ago I wrote this book called Moore's Britannica Lifestyle and Death Style in Britain Today, back in 2015. And in it I talk a lot about styles, styles of life. And those for whom their lifestyle is caught up with their death style. I garden my garden, I want to go back to the earth myself, I like a woodland burial, my way of life and what I want in my death, they come together, on the one hand. On the other hand, people who will not think about death, it's taboo, it's verboten, mustn't talk about it. So lifestyle and death style are far apart. This to me is very interesting as to what's going on in there, not least the question of, of trust, <clears throat> social trust and cultural betrayal. A series of questions that are now not logically following on from each other. So you are going to be a little bit of a hop, skip and a jump going on here. Is death itself a betrayal of life? You live, you do all sorts of stuff, and then death comes along. Do you think death is betraying you as a living person? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, says Christ. Was he forsaken by the Father? Was his mission betrayed? It had already been betrayed by most of his disciples, except for the women, uh, in one way or another. I wrote a book about this many, many years ago, and it's coming back to me now that I'm getting older. Do you feel that life is such that death betrays it for you? I don't know, you know. But think now about legislation and, and the National Health Service. This is a big issue. In this society, the National Health Service looks after us from cradle, but not quite to the grave. In one sense it is to the grave, but in another sense it is not. 
Many of us have put our trust in the National Health Service, not least over COVID. Our trust is in the NHS, one might say. But then, let us say you belong to that smallish, but not very small group of people who want <coughs> assisted suicide when they die. When life, when they're ill, they're diagnosed, serious stuff, and they want to die. And the National Health Service expressly says no. So you've trusted something all your life, and then it says no. It's a little bit like, bit like Jesus and the cross in a way. I don't want to press that analogy too far, but I, I simply put it there. Betrayer. What does it mean to be betrayed by a national institution? In the same way that people would say, <coughs> excuse me, what does it mean to be betrayed by your partner? To be betrayed by all sorts of things. Betrayal is there. Is there a betrayal of the very, of very life itself? That's part of the national debate just now. And I put it up there. Because betrayal is central to Christian identity and to Christian theology. Christ's utterance. We can, can we legitimately, or am I pressing things too far? Can we say to the NHS, why do you forsake me? Well, of course, there are many who oppose that idea, but there are many who want it. That's where Parliament law and the weight of indecision all come in. Which brings me to my, to my conclusion. How do, perhaps, we integrate <coughs> Christian lifestyle and Christian death style? Is it part of the secret in Albert Schweitzer's reverence for life? What that means, reverence for my own life. If I want assisted suicide, does that mean that I have reverence for my own life? Or that I do not have reverence for my own life? That's a question. Or reverence for my own life in all sorts of other ways, not least in my relation to others. And how to live the reverence for life in ecological environmental times. Which means then, and this is, I suppose, one of the, 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 the sting in my lecture in relation to Paul's sting. Has Paul had his day for contemporary Christian death? Should now all the churches be going through their funeral services and crossing out all those vile bodies, all those punishments for sin, all those references to the fall. You might say everything that makes Christian theology what it does, for a great chunk of it. And should it be rewriting it in terms of a, an eco-environmental theology? Perhaps the theology of creation. Because of course there's rather a lot in the Bible about God and creative processes and how to live in, with, and through those Christian processes. That's where, as it were, ethics <coughs> ethics and spirituality of discipleship come into play. They're all there. But it's an issue. And it's an issue because half the nation is voting with its feet for funeral ceremonies that are not of the sting version, but of some kind of non-sting version. And one is walking here as I close. One is walking this narrow path between what some would see as radical apostasy, heresy, impos theological impossibility, and which some would see as remarkable. I recently read a chapter in, in a, a remarkable book called The Making, uh, The Meaning of Mourning. Look it up, it's lovely. <clears throat> the Meaning of Mourning. And believe it or not, the Dalai Lama had sent, or the publishers received, a note from the Dalai Lama to say that this book had impressed him. And I don't think the Dalai Lama is well known for book reviews, to be quite honest. But in there, there's a chapter by Amber, whose surname is just gone, a, a theologian from Notre Dame in America. And it is a truly, truly remarkable piece of theological writing on the dead born 
and neonatal death. What does it mean for a woman to have a dead, her dead child within her? And how might that experience cause a person to re-understand, to rewrite their theology? Maybe impossible for a man to do it. I gave this to one of my students who was doing a dissertation on this, and she came back with her face beaming. She said, I've never read anything like that before. But that's a way of writing theology that is so different from some of the systematic theologies. I raise it because it starts in the body, with the body, and with reverence for life. And for reverence towards something of yours that is dead within you. And Amber asks that question of God. What must God have felt then when his son dies? If you think of Trinitarianism, which is a Christian orthodoxy, as a kind of something united within itself. So there we are, all sorts and elements of things in there, but all really part of a great challenge to Christian theology as to how it deals with some of its core theological ideas of death. And I've not gone into resurrection here as such. Uh, and with a great grand narrative. The grand narrative of salvation history, the grand narrative of ecological environmentalism, and how is it with the disposal of the body stands as a symbol in there for both of them. And I'd better stop there. Thank you very much. A life beyond. Sure. No, destiny does not necessitate uh, afterlife. Destiny can be the nature of the community you are building here, of the kingdom of God on earth. There have been many theological moves in that direction. But having a destiny, uh, it seems to me, is having that kind of intensification of meaning in life. I think when, when someone says, I'm spiritual but not religious, they mean... I know who I am, I know what I like, I know the things that give me a sense of depth in life. My family, my friends, my music, my whatever it might be. This is me, this is the fullness of my being, if you like. And that, I think, is, is a full sense of, of identity. But I think, and, and, and unless one is to ignore religious traditions, one has to go a step further, or philosophies, and say, ah, but, no, you must go beyond your little you and my little me. My, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Well, well done, full marks. But there's another world out there with all sorts of other people, and how do you cope with them? So community fulfillment, uh, fulfillment of the human race itself, there are all sorts of ways of discussing destiny. It doesn't have to be post-mortem. Post you could be a good communist. I want destiny in the communist society. All sorts of things. But I want to bring destiny in, and I want to keep it in, in order not to fall into soft porridge of liking. Now, I've entered this national debate, and I've got a book out called Worldview Religious Studies, published two years ago, precisely because of this debate. Because I've been teaching this for the last seven or eight years before it became part of this national thing, because it's the most sensible thing to do. So have a look. Worldview Religious Studies, Routledge, whatever it was, 2017. And in there, I pick up this issue of destiny. You know, it could, be through, it could be through biological developments. There could be a genetic perspective to human destiny in the elimination of diseases. That would be sensible. So that's how, how I would come at that particular kind of issue. One, two. No. No, it's just about two pounds more. So instead of that big, maybe just that big. Slight. No, when, when, when the skeleton comes out from the machine, the bones are there and they're very friable. So they then have to be crushed up, in the same way the ashes have to be crushed up when they come out from the cremator before they're put into the container. I've seen the process myself and it, um, it just makes sense in the same way that cremation does. But you, it's pure white because cremated remains are, are, are marked by the, the wood burning of the coffin and other stuff in the coffin. That's why human ashes are greyish. But this process doesn't have burning, and so they end up like flour. 
And I've actually raised this issue. What does it mean ritually, symbolically, when human remains are pure white, not a dirty grey? And uh, the guy who cre- invented the system, I remember, I know him well, I was talking to him one day, I said, what about that then? And he said, oh, I haven't thought about that. I thought, well, that's quite an interesting thing, because that's what families are going to be, you know, uh, dealing with. You become pure white, and not a dirty grey. And is that just for stuff? Or is this something we need to bring, as it were, significance to? That remains to be seen. Yeah, what I, yeah, I should have been clearer there. What I meant by that was, just think about how many millions are online at the moment, communicating with each other. Across the world, across everywhere. There's an electronic net linking us all. And that, we, we, we don't really call it a grand narrative, but it is a grand narrative. It's a story about human beings linking with each other. Story. I mean, it's, 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 I, I agree that it's, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah, yeah. a fundamental reality of life, yeah. but it doesn't it's, seem to have the same art. No, I know what you mean. It's not got a good storyline, in the same way that the others have got a storyline. And in the sense that, you know, the ecological one, you can take a David Attenborough as part of the embodiment of the story, or whoever. Uh, it's not a story like that. But if you stand back a little bit from what's going on in all the smartphones and computers across the world at this moment, it, there is a story to be told there about human beings linking with each other and with their dead. So a story of increasing connections. A story of increasing connections, a story of human communication, a story of relationships of a slightly different kind. Yeah, I wanted to turn it into a story, if you like. Please. Online yeah. yeah. Place is big. And it's complex because there's a sense in which is, this is where our project on digital death comes into it. There are all sorts of online platforms where you can remember the dead. All sorts. So that you have a digital post existence, if you like. That's there. How long that would be maintained for is an interesting question. And there are those who would argue that electronic records are not as secure as they might seem to be, but they do the job for the time being. So there's that about it. Some of the established ways of remembering the dead have also gone online, so that most of your, most crematoria have got a room with a big book in it in which you can inscribe the name and the, the, the life facts of a deceased person who's been cremated in that premise. And you can go back, and most of the crems open that book to the day, to today, if you go, it'll be open to today, because you're more likely to go back on an anniversary and see that. Well, now, the company that made those books, and they made them from vellum, they've been part of a, a material culture of monastic-like books, they're now online. So you could just click on and go straight to the page where your mother dates are there. So you could remember her wherever you happen to be, on a bus or at home or or wherever. So there's that sort of uh, memory. There are, um, yeah, there is a sense of loss of place. I think that is going increasingly to happen. But having a place to bury your dead has been a luxury of the last few centuries. If you're rich and you, you are buried in St. George's Chapel, Windsor, you've got a place. But most of the plebs of Britain have never had a place, especially if you're poor and you're a hundred, you're three or four hundred years ago. Graves marked and full, you could put from something like the 1820s, 1830s, through to, let's say, 2020s. But that's a bit of a luxury. And I'm wondering to what extent we can have the luxury of funeral places in the future. If the land, the motto of the Cremation Society of Great Britain, uh, I declare my, I'm an honorary vice president of it, they made it, made, they made me it. Their motto was save the land for the living. And if we are going to need all the land that there is for food, maybe we need to save the land. So there is that issue of space. And your second point was on? Um, so- <laughs> I can't. It was space and something. Resurrection. Um, oh, this is a difficult one. I've done a lot of research with people 
interviewing them on this stuff, as have some of my research students. And it's embarrassing. In the big project we did, published 1995, The Reuse of Old Graves, we interviewed 1,603 people in their own homes, not on the phone, on the street. Big project. Out of which a great deal of stuff came, including facts that uh, for most of the major denominations, uh, most of the ordinary members of those denominations did not believe in resurrection for themselves, though they believed in the resurrection of Jesus. It's one thing for Jesus to be re resurrected, it's quite a different thing for me or you as a Christian. You think, Why is that? That's not logical. Oh, in, in ordinary life it is logical, because most people who believe in life after death believe in the soul going on. Now, Protestants have never liked the soul going on. And formerly in Protestant theology, William Temple was a great example of it. You must not teach the immortality of the soul. You must not do it. Why? Because the moment a person believes he has, she has an immortal soul, they believe they have a right to eternal life. William Temple, no one has a right to eternal life. You receive it as a gift or you don't receive it at all. There we are. So you've got a problem between the theology Christology and the theology of the people at large. So that's a big issue. Um, and I would, yeah, I think that's the way it is in practice. I don't think people are waiting for God to pull them out from the Chipping Sodbury churchyard. And you see, it goes this far because there's some science, scientific Christians in, in the States, in California, who've argued that no, what eternal life is, is being in the mind of God. That God has me, has you, in mind. And that's where our eternity is. That's where our fullness is. Well, now, most Christian theologians blanch at this because they say, you cannot have identity without a body. Therefore, you need resurrection to have a body in order to have an identity and a destiny. Because resurrected bodies and destinies go together in Christianity, in theological practice. But in popular practice, as the old song says, it ain't necessarily so. It's a hard pill to swallow. One of my research students, who had been a, a nonconformist minister for many, many years, did his, his PhD on his congregation. And he spent hours, oh, months, interviewing his flock on their ideas of life after death and stuff. And he came to see me one day in almost a state of trauma. He said, they don't believe it. People who've been coming to my church year in, year out, I preach to them faithfully. He's a pretty intelligent guy. I preach to them, he said, I've taught them, I've taught them. And they don't believe it. That when I go and talk to them, they say quite different things about afterlife and Jesus and resurrection and spirit. And I, I, was, I was almost embarrassed uh, in a way. Um, I don't know why I was embarrassed. But he was in such a state because these were people he knew well over, maybe it was 18 years, I can't remember now, in that particular church, which was a preachy sort of church, not an Anglican sacramental kind of place, if you know what I mean. So really speaking, he thought they should have known better. But the human individual is a very resilient thing when it comes to believing what it wants to believe. And it doesn't always or often believe what the pastor says. Rome is now finding this out in terms of the edicts from the papal chair and what the good people think about contraception down in Darlington. There are lessons that run across the world. Oh, yes. It was part of the funeral rites. Um, I've done a lot of work on the Anglican ones, but it goes before as well. Oh, yeah, it was one of those verses from the Bible, from Genesis, that leapt out to, to Christian um, funerary ritual. And, see, the churches, the British churches, paid practically no attention to cremation. Peter Jupp, uh, many of you will know, Congregational Sociologist of Religion, very good friend of mine. Uh, Peter spent a long time writing this up on the British way of death, going through all the church documents. The long and the short of it is... When cremation came on board, by and large, the churches didn't like it, didn't want it, uh, but they had to come on board in the end or just be left behind. And then when um, the temple himself was cremated, and now you can't be put into Westminster Abbey unless you are cremated. And so cremation came on board, but there was no real theological think-through. 
So we, we commit our brother for cremation. It fitted into the whole thing. But there's been no real theology of cremation behind it. This is why I'm trying to press some of the guys now to think about what the theology of resumation might be. Because it'll take 30 years for the church to catch up, the Church of England and the Baptists of that meeting, to catch up with these things. This became a fashion. And it became a fashion because you can't put your finger on one person for this. It, partly because of funeral directors, partly because of clergy, and the others have come to take services since. Um, the emphasis was on trauma for the people. That to see the coffin being removed, to have the curtains closed, this was an additional negative emotion. That was the argument. Your argument, many would make. Death is final. We're saying farewell. When you put them in the grave and you fill it in, you walk away, you know it is. In a crematorium, sometimes you don't know when it's ended. Unless the funeral director says, no, it's time to you go up that way. So I agree with you. It's, it's, it's a moot point as to when you might talk about closure as a kind of issue, whatever that means, you know. But no, I think it is. And many, many, it's very interesting, many, many years ago, when we did a big project on this, there were so many people talking about cremation being like a conveyor belt thing. And this was what happened really through the 1960s and the 70s, when, there were, when cremation was now becoming dominant, dominant funeral form. You had to pack them in, get them through. And Britain did something really weird. Uh, it, it, in churches, it changed... And then in crematoria, it changed a whole cultural pattern. In churches, you come in through one door, and you go out to the same door, especially in the sort of your classic Anglican thing. Weddings, you come in, you go out. Funerals, you come in, you go out. Then they decided they'd take them out with a side door. Because by bringing them in, service, packing them out, next one could come in and out. So that my reading of it was, I might be wrong, but my reading of it was that people had an experience of being conveyor belted, as it were, as an idiom. In you come, blop, out you go. And then the cars pick you up and take you off right around. We surveyed British Krems, this is all published. We surveyed British Krems at that point, this is about 20, 30 years ago now. And only, I think it was 11% of British crematoria had actual conveyor belts. So the idiom of conveyor belting was not really, I think, about conveyor belts, but it was the idiom of being processed. Something like that, which is quite remarkable.